that's it. So Martha, you're doing all kinds of relaxing? Um, Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, come to think of it. We, um, I didn't have, we had power knocked out with the storm. <gasps> So yeah. um, I I fled to Minnesota. Well, there you go. Warm showers. So it's been fun being with kids and grandkids. Yeah, it's been an interesting year, that's for sure. You ready to start school? No. <laughs> no, but we had our meeting with the school to figure everything out. So the, they start, why it starts on Wednesday and will starts on Thursday and then they all start on Friday. So Good. Good. we're prepared at least. Yeah. Okay. I, we just got two waiting, but I'm going to admit them. There's three. Okay. Yep. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Pretty good. Hi, Angie. Hi. Hi, Suzanne. Welcome, Jeremy. Well, Diane, it is 12.01, so we'll go ahead and get started. And if you would, just admit those people as they come. Well, welcome to session five of Navigating Special Needs Family Training. We are so excited to be talking about navigating school with you today and excited about our presenter. Welcome to everyone who has joined us. It's nice to see uh, faces from across the state and be together today. So just a few Zoom logistics. Um, keep your microphone muted unless you're talking or unless we ask you to unmute. Um, for the most part, we will have time for you to, uh, to take your uh, self off of mute and to reflect during different times. Uh, we love to see your smiling faces, so keep your video um, on unless you have something private to do. Um, if you have questions for this speaker, you can put those in the chat. I'll collect them and then we can discuss them at the end. If there's anything pressing, I will let Jill know and we can uh, um, get to that at that point. Um, and then um, at the end, we'll have a discussion time. Just a few things to guide our discussion. Uh, we want to give everybody the opportunity to share their experience. So we share the air with each other. And remembering that what we say here today is confidential, so please keep that in mind. And then speak from your own experience. We love to hear what has happened to you um, and what has occurred and what you've learned. So I feel like we can grow from each other in this space. And then only give advice if you're asked. So um, one thing we would ask in Zoom, if, um, 
So you'll see there your name there. If it's different than there, you can right click on that and rename yourself. So you have the option to put something else in. And so that way we know who you are and we can keep attendance that way. Um, so in the, for an icebreaker, we want to know a little bit about what was your favorite thing in school? If you would go ahead and chat that in and we'll get to know you a little bit better. Ah, uh, Jill says recess, <laughs> Allison says art. Martha, new school supplies. That sounds like a teacher right there. <laughs> Library time, Suzanne, yes. Math, Angie, wow. That's very few people like math. Chocolate milk at lunch, yes. Time test, wow, Jeremy. <laughs> that is very rare. Art and writing, yes, very creative things. Well, it's nice to hear um, the differences in everybody and what we find enjoyable. So now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Um, Jill Stevens is, Stevenson sorry, is a family advocate from Southwest Iowa. She lives with her husband and two sons. She's been advocating for her 14-year-old son, Wyatt, since he was diagnosed on the autism spectrum. Jill has four years of experience as a special education paraeducator in a public school district. She is a 2018 graduate of the Iowa Family Leadership Training Institute, yay, um, and she is also a mentor for the IFLTI program. She's on the Iowa Regional Autism Assistance Program Advisory Council, and she has her own 501c3 nonprofit organization and is a service coordinator for early access. Jill, you're a very busy woman and yet you found time for us. So I will stop share and let you take. All right, I'm going to share my screen first here. Hold on. Get this the way I want it here. Here we go. Okay, now I'm going to share my screen. Sorry about that. Okay. How's that look, everyone? Look okay? All right. So I'm going to share with you um, what 14 years of research and life experience has taught me when raising a child on the autism spectrum. Um, I will not have all the answers to your questions because our journeys are all different. This is just the information that I have compiled and the research that I have done with all the connections that I have made in this journey that I've been on. But I do hope um, to give you great resources and the confidence you need to grow in your capacity as your child's advocate through this. And if I don't have the answer, then these resources, hopefully you'll be able to do your own digging and find the answers that you need as like I did. Um, I did want to start with a poll, if we can get that up. What age group is your child with a special health care need in right now? Just to give me an idea of where they're at um, zero to three, three to five elementary, middle school, high school, or beyond. If you type that in and submit it. And Rachel, I don't think I can see, so you wanna tell me? Absolutely, it looks like we have 38% with three to five year olds. Um, close neck and neck is zero to three elementary and middle school. Uh, and high school is sitting right in between there at 25% um, and then 13% being those other categories. It looks like we have a good age range there to talk about today. So um, I hope to touch on all different areas, um, like I said, and give kind of a brief overview 
so that you can go on and do the research that you need to do. So I did want to go over some terms as we go along, some things you may have already heard and are familiar with and others you may not be. Um, so I wanted to start with the IFSP, which is the Individualized Family Service Plan. And that's a plan obtained um, special education services to young children that are ages from zero to three years. So those are, you might have heard early access, that's going to be your early access age grouping. Um, it is provided by law to families of eligible children. And, and eligibility for early access means that they have at least a 25% delay in one or more um, developmental area that would qualify them for services or if they have a qualifying um, condition that would also qualify them automatically for services. The IFSP team consists of early access providers, a service coordinator, parents, guardians, and family members um, that would help contribute to the needs. With an IFSP and early access, it is family-driven outcomes and goals, so you are very much a part of the process and it you know, it's based on what your needs are in your daily routines. An IEP is Individualized Education Program. It is a legal document under the United States law that it is developed for each public school child in the United States who needs special education. So this is created for your, it's called Part B, is what they call that, Part B of IDEA, which I'm going to speak about. Um, that are school kids that are going into be school aged is what the IEP is for. Um, it is created through a team consisting of, but not limited to, a special education teacher, general education teacher, representative of the school, AEA representatives, and then the parents and guardians, the student as appropriate, and I will talk about that, and anyone else that you would like to invite to be a part of the process with you. An IEP is reviewed annually um, and they have team driven goals. So as a team, you get together and decide the goals for your child. And an IFSP is reviewed every six months. So that's just a general overview. So we have, we're on the same page here. So going forward, um, I wanted to talk about IDEA, which is Individuals with Disabilities Education Act which I referenced um, for zero to three-year-olds for early access. That is part C of IDEA, which can get confusing. And then school-based services is part B. And you're going to hear those terms quite a bit when dealing with if your child is transitioning from part C, early access, to part B, child-based services. That's kind of the terminology that they use as part C to be so they're good things to know, which I didn't know starting out. So I wanted to share that with you. Um, IDEA is the law that provides special education. It also identifies educational rights and procedures that public school districts must follow. So if you're not familiar completely with IEDA, um, I really think you need to know what this is in more depth, which I'm not going to get to today, but I will give you the resource for that. Um, there's guidance in there that addresses bullying and different topics that I have used in advocating for my son. So, like I said, in different situations in your life, it's very important to dig deep and to find out exactly what is in there it has to offer for your family. Um, another term that you're going to hear is FAPE, the Free Appropriate Public Education. These are the rights given under ID IDEA or the supports and services needed to benefit from school. And this is at no cost to the student or his or her family. Um, so that's a part of IDEA. And then another term, I'm gonna catch up here, is LRE, Least Restrictive Environment. It's based on the presumption that the general education environment is the first choice for educating all individuals. So LRE refers to a related set of requirements aimed at providing individuals with disabilities first an appropriate education 
and the special assistance needed for success in the general education environment. And LRE is not contingent on funding issues. So those are all terms that I believe parents need to know and aren't often taught about that I had to stumble upon along the way. Um, I strongly, again, recommend that you familiarize yourself with these terms because they are a part of your parental rights and they are important. So next, getting into kind of parental rights and procedural safeguards. I just wanted to see as a show of hands where you can use the little icons at the bottom if you're familiar with those. Give me a thumbs up or a wave or you can just physically wave. Um, if you feel like you understand what your parental rights and procedural safeguards are right now, if you feel like you have a really good understanding of that, raise your hand. If not so much, then then just just don't. But I just want to see if people, you know, if you really feel like you have a good understanding of what is available to you. Okay. And this is something, especially at first, they hand you that book and I did not read through it. You know, everything was so overwhelming. You know, when my son started preschool at three that things go so fast and I didn't even think to read through it, of course, until you have that need. And then someone says, hey, you need to read through this. So about parental rights, I think, um, knowing your parental rights and special education is one of the most important things that you can do to advocate for your child. So by doing your research before IEP meetings, you will not only have a better understanding of what is being said to you, but you will be more confident when giving your feedback to the team. So key items to know um, are what your participation rights are what notice rights you have, consent rights, records rights, independent educational evaluation rights, dispute resolution is in there, rights for reimbursements, and uh, the transfer of rights. They're all in there. All the rights are important. I know it's a lot of reading, but just take your time and read through it and get a good understanding of what those are, especially, it's hard to think about now but as you, your child grows and gets older, there's going to be points in your life that you're probably going to need to look upon those. Um, you, and then I'm going to give you a reference at the end and I'm going to kind of show you this website that was just kind of adapted. It's called the, the Iowa IDEA informative website. And you can search for IEP procedural safeguards and all kinds of different things that I'll get into in a little bit. Okay, so part C, the IFSB to part B. Um, so once a child receives, who is receiving early access part C services turns three years old, then they no longer qualify for early access and will need to transition to other services. So the term DS meeting or disability suspect meeting is something you hear. And that is when you suspect the child might have a qualifying disability or developmental delay for school services, part B. Then consent for an evaluation needs to be signed to determine eligibility for school services. So for part C, um, there is a list of qualifying conditions for services for your child or if they have a 25% delay in one or more area to receive services. Well, for school services for part B, having a disability alone does not automatically qualify the child for services. They must go through an evaluation to determine if accommodations are needed in the school setting. So that's something that a lot of people don't know and I did not know that at the beginning either, but just having that diagnosis alone doesn't always mean that they won't be able to go through school settings without accommodations. So they still have to go through some, some type of an evaluation. Um, if the evaluation shows a delay or disability is suspected, you will continue to an IEP meeting for school services 
or whatever, if for preschool or whatever services are available in your area, then they will help you with that process at that time. Okay, so preparing for your IEP meeting. Now, IEP meetings can be brutal, and I don't know, even the best IEP meeting I ever have, it's still agonizing getting ready to go to them. I mean, I think we all can probably agree on that if, <laughs> because you, it's just so uncertain and everyone you want what's best for your child. And, and we all have, you know, I'm sure have instances where things didn't always go the way you thought they were going to go. So there can be a lot of anxiety, which is the word IEP meeting. <laughs> So your role as a family member of a student receiving special education services is to participate in the process by sharing information about your child and stating his or her strengths and your concerns. I like to say strengths because I think it can be so easy to just focus on the concerns and it kind of can turn negative really quickly and then by the end of it, you can feel beat up. And let's face it, I have cried at IEP meetings because you just feel like your child is being attacked sometimes. I don't think that's what is meant to happen. They're just trying to foresee challenges, but I think it's very, very important to look at the strengths of your child and to focus on those also and say, okay, but this is how my child does learn and these are the strengths. So if they're a visual learner, how can we help them? How can we make that work and use that? Or they learn through music, through songs. So how can we adapt that to make it a positive experience through their day? So definitely if it starts to turn more towards the concerns, try to bring it back to those strengths and focus on the good things too. Otherwise, you do leave that meeting just feeling kind of lost and just very discouraged. Um, you will need to think about any special considerations such as transition, communication, behavior, health needs, or assistive technology. So before even going into your meetings, kind of have those things in your mind of what those things are that really are going to make your child successful. You will also at the meeting establish what your priorities are and these will most likely represent your child's goals to the end. So what are their most urgent needs and then that's usually what is focused on to become a goal area on their IEP. And then send any private evaluations if you have doctors evaluations or therapist or anything like that, try to send those reports to the IEP team ahead of time so they have a chance to go over them before the meeting. And that's always helpful so you can be on the same page, right, to get into it and don't have to try to sift through that information and waste some valuable time going forward with, with that. And then as a family, you have the right to request an IEP meeting at any time you feel it is necessary to review or discuss the IEP. And there, you can make amendments at any time. That is one of your parental rights. So in the 11 years that my son has been in the public school systems, we have held over, it's been around 35 to 40 meetings to address his needs or our concerns. So he's been in the public school for 11 years. We've held 35 to 40 meetings. So I can't stress enough if something's not right in your gut, if you have questions, if you have concerns, get the IEP team together because you have to be comfortable and you need to know what's going on. You do know your child best and you need to be there and you need to be involved with that team. So you can call meetings anytime you want to. You don't have to amend the IEP at every meeting, but you need to ask those questions and you have the right to get the team together at any time for any reason. We, like I said, that's a lot of meetings in 11 years, but it has definitely been beneficial for our son. So uh, at the IEP meeting, so I just want a show of hands or a thumbs up or whatever. Um, at the IEP meeting, do you feel comfortable? Do you feel like you're being heard as a parent advocate? 
So I'd just like to see a thumbs up or a wave. If you feel like you're being heard, if you feel comfortable when you're a part of those meetings. So that's good. I see some thumbs up and that's always very, very important because you want to know that your voice is being heard and that you want to feel like, you know, people care about your child and they want to do what's best. So that's very important to have people there that are listening to you. Um, as a parent and guardian, you are the most important part of the IEP team by far. You know your child better than anyone and have valuable information to share. So at the IEP meeting, goals will be written based on your child's educational needs and may include other concerns such as language, behavior, or social skills. Again, ask questions. Don't be afraid to speak up if you need clarification or don't understand what has been said. The team of people in the room with you don't expect you to understand every term they use or every process going into the meeting, especially if it's your first meeting or your first couple of meetings. So ask questions and they will sit there and they will say, you know, and, and sometimes it's very easy for the professionals and educators, they've gone to throw through so many of these meetings. So they'll use term like, so for the DS meeting or, or LRE or, you know, they'll just start using terms all the time. And sometimes it just goes over your head as a parent because it's the first time you're hearing these things. So you need to stop them in that moment and say, okay, what does that mean? <laughs> and, you know, please tell me what those initials mean and what you're saying that, how is that affecting my child? Because, and then they're going to back up and they're going to say, oh, I'm so sorry. We just start talking and forget that, you know, that's probably the first time you've heard that term. Term. So please stop and ask questions. So when you leave that meeting, you feel comfortable in everything that you've heard and you feel comfortable that you're understanding what was talked about. Um, something that might be talked about or should be talked about at the IEP meeting is least restrictive environment. So the IEP team um, will decide how the, the student will participate in the general education setting and will identify how much time will be spent in each setting. And that's where, you know, they're going to set how much time is going to be, if they have to be pulled for some services, how much time is going to be spent out of general education services, how much time is going to be spent in general education services. So that should always be talked about and, um, at each IEP meeting. Um, and then the IEP must include a description of how progress will be measured and when reports will be provided. And I always like to throw in there, I like to make sure I know who is measuring the progress because if your child has a one-on-one -on -one para or aid, are they taking the data? Who's taking the data? That's something, I'm a data person, I'm a research person, so I want to know it's going to be consistent. It's not going to be five different teachers collecting the data. So that's always something that I throw in there personally um, to make sure who's collecting that. So I go into every IEP meeting over-prepared, but I over-prepare for everything. I run every scenario through my mind and come up with an answer to every question the district may ask. I like to be prepared. My husband says he feels like I'm prosecuting him the day before every meeting because I run through everything out loud with him and he's always like, I'm on your side. <laughs> but that's just the process I go through because at the beginning I didn't. You go in and I feel like, you feel like you get ambushed and that's not the intention, but you go in blind and all these things happen and you leave. And afterwards I'd always be like, well, I should have done this, I could have done that. So I'm, I just am in the practice now of doing that. So he's kind of my little board to bounce things off of. So history has taught me to expect the unexpected. So I prepare for it. And that's just how I do things. You'll never fully be prepared for anything that's gonna happen. But if you know your child and you know what your priorities are for your child, then you can work with whatever that is suggested. Okay, so I wanted to touch briefly on the 504 plan. While I don't have any personal experience with it, I know families and friends that do. So here's what I do know. 
a 504 plan is a plan developed to ensure that a child who has a disability identified under the law and is attending an elementary or secondary school receives accommodations that will ensure their academic success and access to the learning environment. So to be eligible, a student must meet one of the following criteria. So they must have a mental or physical limitation that significantly impacts one or more essential life activity. So that could be learning, concentrating, walking, social interactions, breathing and dieting, you know, what their diet is. So that's what I know briefly. So to compare the 504 and the IEP, the difference that I've seen is that an IEP is an in-depth document for all students who require special education services. A 504 plan can accommodate students who can learn within general education with stated modifications. An IEP can provide services and supports that a 504 plan cannot, such as specialized instruction. So there, there are some um, differences there. And like I said, I have some friends that have kids on 504 plans, but the main difference is that they function well in a general education class. They just need some accommodations there is what I'm seeing. Okay, so transition. So this picture, I kind of love. It was taken in 2018 at the Autism Acceptance Day on the Hill. Wyatt walked right up to Governor Reynolds. He shook her hand and took his first step in becoming a self-advocate. I couldn't have been more proud. My husband and I literally were turned the other way and we looked around and he was up there with her. <laughs> so we were like, yay, he was confident. He went right up to her. So to talk about transition plan, um, in this sense, it is a process that we are currently now in with Wyatt because he is 14 and he's going to be a freshman in high school and I'm freaking out. <laughs> so the transition plan um, is a formal process for helping students with an IEP plan for after school and how to get there. So it is required by law that the transition planning must start by the time your child is 16, but typically it starts at 14. So we did start talking about this um, last year when he was in eighth grade. We, we did hold, hold a transition planning meeting and started his plan last year when he turned 14. Um, an IEP outlines transition goals and services for the student. The transition plan is based on the student's individual needs. It's based on their strengths, skills, and interests. So to help them develop what they wanna do after. Major components of the plan are to write measurable post-secondary goals. So to identify transition services, write the course study and coordinate services with adult agencies if that's something that you're wanting to look into. So in transition um, is a term in this instance that refers to the right the student has for the school to assist in preparing for a job, education, and the way the student wants to live after graduation. And like I said, we started that and it's very scary Got a dry mouth. So while I was doing my research about transition planning for Wyatt, I came across a piece of information that I hadn't thought about before. In all of my planning, which is a lot, I had neglected to realize that Wyatt will be 18 years old for most of his senior year in high school. As he started when he was six in kindergarten, so in October of his senior year, he will turn 18. So as I read the words, age of majority, I became completely panicked as I saw the four years of parental control that I thought I had turn into three years. So the planning that I had just lost a year. So age of majority, I think is something very important that I didn't even know about. <laughs> so I want to share a little bit about that with you. Um, the age of majority is when 
your child obtains the right of an Iowa citizen and is legally responsible for his or her own decisions, including educational decisions. So in Iowa, your child reaches the age of majority when he or she turns 18 or when they get married. And he better not get married before he's 18. <laughs> if your child under 18 is tried, convicted, and sentenced as an adult and is, con is confined in an adult correctional facility, your child's rights to make educational decisions transfer during the period of incarceration. Once your child reaches the age of majority, the parents and guardians no longer have the right to due process or to seek mediation. A parent or guardian may still file a written state complaint, but that is all you can do at that point. The parent and guardian no longer has the right to attend or call an IEP meeting unless the student tells the IEP team to invite them. But the school does have the option to invite the parent and guardian. Do I need to read that again? Because that one's the one that got me. <laughs> if he doesn't want me at his IEP meeting, I'm not there. <laughs> so that one scared me the most, I think. So I have to really prepare him now. You do have the option to petition the court for guardianship, conservatorship, or to become an educational power of attorney if you feel your child cannot make those decisions. You do have to do that before they turn 18. And there's a whole process to that that I'm not going to get into, but I do have resources for you to look into that. So our hope for Wyatt is that he will be an independent, happy, healthy man, but we just lost a year in the process of helping him obtain that before we have to make any decisions about guardianship, conservatorship, or educational power of attorney. But we do have a plan in place now with a timeline set and continued faith in Wyatt that he will be able to meet his goals. But we also have a backup plan and a timeline. It can be hard to look that far ahead, but I strongly suggest, especially based on my experience, that you do that because it will sneak up on you very, very quickly. Okay, everybody take a deep breath with me. <laughs> so I'm going to touch on COVID-19 because I, it would not be right if I didn't touch on this in the times that we're having. Um, it would be nice to think that we can send our children back to school and everything will be just fine. But if you're anything like me as a parent or guardian of a child with a special health care need, I have learned time and time again that the best case scenario usually doesn't work out for us. And starting a new school year in one of the most stressful times of the year for us, um, and with uh, the pandemic, it's just going to be hard. So we prepare and we plan for every other possible outcome that we may, that may happen so we're not throwing a curveball. Well, to say my mind has been in overdrive trying to plan for school in the midst of COVID-19 would be an understatement. And I'm sure that you feel the same way. So just a quick raise your hand or thumbs up who has anxiety about this school year? <laughs> I have anxiety about every school year because it's never fun to start with new teachers and new routines and you know everything that goes along with new schools and all of that, but to throw a public health emergency and pandemic into it is just even harder. So in the current times that we are having, um, navigating school, it's just going, it's, it's going to be hard. I have read the guidance and then I have read, and then the guidance changed. So I read the new guidance and it changed. <laughs> so I wish I could tell you that things will not change again, but 
I mean, I can't do that. They change daily almost, it seems. So what I can do is give you my best advice and my best resources that I have for COVID-19's ever-changing guidelines. So again, I will not have all the answers for this, but I don't believe anybody does. So here's what I have. If your child is attending school in the traditional brick and mortar setting, I would just say go over your IEP. And some of you might have already started school, so I'm sure you've done this, but go over your IEP with a fine tooth comb and any accommodations that you feel are needed that may not have been on there prior to COVID-19. Whether it is for safety, whether, so safety in my mind, just an example is if your child has a one-on-one -on -one para or aid, do you feel like they should wear a face covering at all times? Or, you know, that's just an example that I've had with somebody um, that has added that into an IEP. You know, just things like that um, are something to think about now that we've never had to think about before. Um, whether it's social, emotional, if you think they're going to need extra breaks during the day just to get away from all the extra stress that they're around. Um, whether it's dietary, and I don't even know what that would look like right now, just whatever is going to make you feel more comfortable about sending your child to school, you should address your concerns with the IEP team and just see what creative ideas you could come up with. I know that I visited with our school about things and they were wide open because they understand they're anxious about the school year as well and they want to help families feel comfortable too. Um, so if your child is going to be doing remote learning, um, again, go through your IEP with your team and prioritize your child's accommodations. So I would ask questions like, while my child is doing schoolwork, what are the most important accommodations that they need when they're at school? And then ask yourself, do you have access to those accommodations at home? Will the school loan you a sensory object or a ball chair to use at home? Do you need the school to make a visual schedule for home for you to use that's similar to what they use at school? Will you have access to his para or aid, even if it's just a Zoom meeting to say hi or just to check in for social emotional reasons? Um, any of those accommodations. How will you use accommodations at home? Do you have a separate space to set up a work area with a visual schedule, the sensory objects that maybe isn't the dining room table just to keep it like for us, keeping things separate. If you eat at the dining room table, that's where you eat. If you work somewhere, it's gotta be the workspace. If your child's like that, do you have a separate area to do those things in? Um, do you have a separate space for your child to take a break? If they get a break during the day at school, which my son does, um, what does that look like at home? What does it look like at school? And how can you duplicate that at home? to make it look as familiar to them as possible. And then prepare your child with what the day-to-day -day is going to look like while doing remote learning, just like you would prepare them for when they go back to school. Go through the day-to-day, -day, go through their schedule of this is what your schedule is gonna look like. This is what break looks like at home compared to what it looks like at school. This is what lunch at home looks like prepared at school. One thing I thought of is what does bathroom break look like at home compared to school? They're used to just coming and going to the bathroom whenever they want. Can they still do that based on what kind of remote learning your school is offering? If the teacher is live, that's probably not going to work. So you need to work through those things based on what your choices are and what your school is doing. And then work with the school district and your AEA to get the most important resources and accommodations for a successful learning experience at home. Um, so I do have a quick resource to give you that's, it is the website that was recently launched. There are resources for the intervention, part C, part B, including parental rights, COVID-19 resources and links. Um, 
And I, th I think the most important thing that we can do for our children and ourselves and our school districts this year is to show grace whenever possible. None of us could have predicted this public health emergency and no matter what your opinions are, um, this is what we have and we have to navigate it the best we can. Um, and we have to listen to each other as best we can and ask questions and try to work together to make it the, the best situation for our children. Um, so I am going to get to this website really quick because I wanted to show you, okay, can you see this? Um, this is the Iowa IDEA information website um, and there'll be a link that you will get for this. Um, but this is what I was talking about. So you can go up at the top and there's early access, birth to three years, early childhood, special education, secondary. So if you just wanna click on the age group, that you're under. It has all kinds of parent resources um, that you can go to, but then there's at the very bottom of this page that you go to, they have COVID resource page. So if you go down to that link, um, you can follow these and they do update the dates of when things were updated. So you can see when the latest information was updated. This was updated on August 1st for early access, as was this one. For school base, these were updated and the, the perimeters and different things. So this is going to be your most updated information for and even what the schools are given of what their parameters are of what they can do and can't do um, just for your resources there. But I think this site, like I said, it talks about the 504 plans. It talks about IEPs and all general guidance. So I think, and then um, at the bottom, there is a translate section that I almost forgot to talk about, Rachel. <laughs> but you can click on the bottom here and you can select a language. And so some resources you will be able to get in different um, languages. So I think that um, is really awesome because some families that I work with, you know, we don't all speak the same language. So um, that will be, there'll be a link for that for you so you can go and dig in and read all you want about um, on that site. So I think now if I can get back to, oh, no, no, no. Oh, So that, so anyway, I think that will be something and as they update different guidances as we go along that you can follow along with. So next. Okay, so I wanted to touch on organization. Um, for me, being organized is right up there with knowing your parental rights and doing your research, whether it's an article that I read or an email from a teacher, I have to keep it all um, organized. So if you saw one of our other trainings, they, we did touch on organization. So there are care notebooks and there will be a site for that that you can click on to keep all of your um, child's health care resources in. I cannot live without my IEP binder. I keep everything in there, the IEP, parental safeguards, report cards. If you're looking for one of those, ask your special education teacher or your um, AEA representative or your family and educator partnership and they should be able to get an IEP binder for you. If you're curious about what tabs to put in it and make your own, um, just email me and I can get that information to you for the IEP binder. I take it to all my meetings. I can't live without it. And then for emails, if to email, um, I, so I organize my emails with like teacher names or the school's name and just throw them all in there to keep them organized or the doctor's name. Um, so developing a strong team, communication is really important as um, in Diane's presentation and her webinar we went through. Um, I now feel like I have a really strong IEP team. We work really well together. It's important to 
and develop a good relationship with your team built on mutual respect with the understanding that everyone wants what is best for your child. By doing your research, being organized, knowing your rights, listening, and not being afraid to ask questions, you will open the lines of communication. Um, if everyone is willing to listen to each other, you will be able to come up with solid plans for your child to have a successful school year. And and if you're feeling as if you're not being heard, your child's needs are changing or your child's needs are not being met, you do have a right to call an IEP meeting at any time to make amendments. And then you also do have the right to bring in uh, another party like the family educator partner um, to help you work through that at any time. And I like to put this on there. Brene Brown is probably my favorite author. I love reading her. and. I have to say this to myself before any meeting, especially an IEP meeting. I'm not here to be right. I'm here to get it right. And I think if everybody goes into the IEP meetings with that mindset that they're, you know, you're not here to have the right answer. You're just here to get it right for your child and you all can, can, can succeed. So this is a list of resources for you. And I think that is on um, one of the worksheets in the check, if I am right. Um, and then I like that little, until you have a child with a special health care need, um, with a special health care need, you have no idea of the depth of your strength, tenacity, and resourcefulness. I truly, um, Wyatt gave me a purpose. He gave me a goal. He gave me something. Um, that all is irreplaceable. And I found my strength within him and what he's given me. So before I open it up for questions, I want to leave you with this. You are your child's voice, their comfort and their strength. They believe in you, trust in you and love you unconditionally. You know them better than anyone else. So please do your research, build a team on mutual respect know your rights, get organized, and make connections with as many people as you can to help you along the way. So I think we're about ready for time's up, Rachel, but if there's any questions that I can answer quickly. Yeah, we don't have any in the chat, but you can unmute yourself and ask your question. I don't right. have a uh, question, but I just wanted to say thank you, Jill. Um, my son has not been diagnosed autistic yet, but we are going in November. And um, I really appreciated this. Thank you, Sarah. Well, thank you so much. And like I said, my email is on there and all of our emails. And, you know, if you need any help along the way, we'd be more than happy to help you out and get the resources you need because it is a hard start. It's, it's not easy for anyone and it's along the way, you know, it's, it's never easy. So it's always nice to have a good group to help you work through it and we would be happy to do that. Thank you so much, Jill, for sharing that. What a depth of knowledge you are. Um, and it, it was great to hear. Thank you. So what would you like to remember? You can chat this in or unmute. Maybe what, what is one thing you're going to do? Call that IEP meeting. <laughs> We heard that. Let me see what's in the chat here. Allison says to be her child's voice. Yes, that came through loud and clear. I'm having trouble advancing my slide from here. So hold on just a second. All right, so let's talk about kind of what's coming up next. For our next session. So in two weeks, we'll meet again um, and hear from Lynn Park about navigating waivers, then exploring care coordination and finding resilience and hope. 
You can find these recorded webinars on our website at Child Health Specialty Clinics or chsc.org backslash IFLTI. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to email me and you'll continue to receive those uh, reminders with the Zoom link. And now we're going to pop in a short evaluation. If you would complete that and help us continue to improve, that would be great. Thank you everyone for attending. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next time. Thank you. I'm working on the link. So just one minute. Okay, here we go. You should be able to just uh, click on that and have it take you directly to the link. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.